So the title of this article reads, Scarlett Johansson sues Disney for breach of contract over Black Widow release. It says Disney's decision to release Black Widow on Disney Plus at the same time it hit theaters has sparked a legal battle with Scarlett Johansson, the actress tasked with playing the Marvel superhero. In a lawsuit filed Thursday in Los Angeles Superior Court, attorneys for Johansson allege that the star's contract was breached when the studio opted not to debut the film exclusively in theaters, a move they claim depressed ticket sales for the Avengers spinoff. Much of Johansson's compensation was tied to the box office performance of Black Widow. If it, hurt, if it hit certain benchmarks, bonuses would kick in. By the way, I think that means that it's not hitting those benchmarks. I'm just throwing that in there. Disney intentionally induced Marvel's breach of con quote Disney intentionally in induced Marvel's breach of the agreement without justification in order to prevent Miss Johansson from realizing the full benefit of her bargain with Marvel. The suit reads. So as Disney announced in March that Black Widow would premiere spontaneously on the studio's subscription-based streaming service for a premium $30 price, as well as on the big screen. Anybody, if you've ever watched this show before, you know I hate this model. I think it's disgusting. I will never, ever use this. Uh, I, I hate the fact that I already pay a subscription fee to Disney+, Plus, and then on top of that, I have to pay a premium for certain movies. I will never do it. Never, never, never. And I advise you not to do it either if you, if you, if you, if you, if you want to discourage this business model, I say, don't, don't do it either. Uh, the move was made as the movie theater industry was rebounding uh, from the pandemic. It uh, says on July 9th, Black Widow set a pandemic era box office record with its 80 million debut in North America and earned an additional 78 million overseas. It also pulled in 60 million on Disney Plus. Ticket sales repeatedly re steeply declined in subsequent weeks and currently stand at 319 million globally putting Black Widow on track to become, become one of the lowest grossing Marvel movies of all time. Of course, it is interesting to note that $60 million amount on Disney Plus, and I guess we'll see if that goes up or not. So shortly after the debut, the National Association of Theater Owners, the industry's main trade organization, asserted the simultaneous release of Black Widow in theaters and on streaming, quote, cost Disney money in revenue per viewer over the life of the film. Interestingly enough, the suit notes that Disney stock price rose after the, the company disclosed their rental figures. So here's another quote from the lawsuit says Disney chose to placate Wall Street investors and pad its bottom line rather than allow its subsidiary Marvel to comply with the agreement. Note, to no one's surprise, Disney's breach of the agreement successfully pulled millions of fans away from the theater and towards its Disney Plus streaming service. There is a little bit more to this article. You can check it out on Variety. But the bottom line is, is that Scarlett Johansson uh, feels that she is being ripped off and that Disney did this sort of deliberately. Uh, they knew what the repercussions were. They knew what her contract said. Um, and this is really interesting in the context of the streaming wars. Uh, you know, Dave, I, I recall when we talked about, um, it's been a while, but we, we, we talked about when the Writers Guild was finishing up their lawsuit with CBS All Access, it's kind of interesting. It was like the almost part of the official rebranding. It was one of the last CBS All Access articles that was out there. The Writers Guild had sued uh, CBS All Access because basically for the same thing. Because what's happening is because the rights, when it comes to your residuals and things like that, or maybe there's certain benchmarks, or maybe you have a point system, all those different ways that that Hollywood compensates their talent. And that includes writers, right? Directors, all sorts of other folks besides actors. There is a lot of stuff that is basically out of date. It doesn't take into account the streaming services. It doesn't take into account this little hybrid thing that they're doing where, you know, Disney Plus is streaming, but it's also basically doing video on demand, right? It's doing both. It's doing the subscription and video on demand models at the same time. And apparently, Scarlett Johansson's contract didn't cover that. Which is really interesting because you would think, at least I would think, Scarlett Johansson, you know, being sort of an A-list celebrity and the team that she has, you would think they would think about that. And they would have these things put into her contract so that if something like this had happened, that they would, she would get, you know, the proper compensation that she, she believes that she, 
she deserves, right? That, that she would have gotten if it had been a, a theater exclusive, right? Because that's the argument here is that by doing both, you're, you're basically depressing the, the, the value at the, at the box office for the theater and th thus she's losing money because her contract doesn't cover the streaming stuff, or at least not in the same way. So it's really interesting, and I think this is really interesting in the context, the overall context of the streaming wars, because it really does talk about how talent is compensated when it comes to these different streaming platforms and these different streaming models. One part of this article I didn't read was they mentioned that, because uh, we, we criticize Time Warner, we, we, we criticize Warner Brothers all the time. Warner Brothers just didn't do this. Warner Brothers did do bonuses to their stars for the, all the films that are showing up on HBO Max. They did compensate them. In other words, and, they did decide to appease them. So I think it's really interesting. And and I'll I'll do that one even one better. Um, we talked about, I think last episode or episode before last, we talked about, I mentioned how important it is to read the contracts, right? Right. Um, mm -hmm. When you're signing a contract, it's important to always read your contract. Um, never had a chance to do this before, so let me add that allow me to do this right now. Let me thank my uh, my former boss, Jim Lee, um, for um, actually making a point to make sure that the creators working over at DC Comics under his tenure um, actually see a portion of the digital sales of the comic books, you know, Warner Brothers and DC Comics. Um, now, other professionals may feel differently. This is my personal opinion I'm about to give you. Um, but uh, Jim Lee uh, said that he wanted to do right by the comics creators um, when they set up the deals that they set up with Comixology and stuff. And because of that, because of the contracts that they gave us to sign that were addendums and additions, um, you know, I see a small percentage if you buy Batman Incorporated on Comixology. I actually see a small residual for that um, because of the work that Jim Lee and Dan DiDio uh, actually did over at DC Comics and the fact that Warner Brothers wanted to make sure that we were compensated. I said before that it's weird, but you know, Len Wein, a uh, great writer, uh, huge, huge, I'm a huge fan of his, uh, one of my favorite writers of all time, wrote the comic book that inspired me to get in the comic condition in the first place, everybody, Batman versus the Incredible Hulk. Um, love Len Wein and got to meet him many years. Uh, Len since passed away, but um, he used to tell us all the time, he would do it on panels, he would say it one-to-one -one talking to people that he saw more money for his creation of Lucius Fox for the Christopher Nolan movies than he ever saw for his creation of Wolverine. Right. So that's just crazy when you think about that. Wolverine, he doesn't see anything for Wolverine, but he, he does see money actually for Lucius Fox or did. Um, and so just want to personally publicly thank, you know, Jim Lee and, and uh, Dan DiDio and the folks over at DC and Warner Brothers that were there at that time and, and do it right by creators. Because you're right, Eric, that's the thing. When when people talk bad about Warner Brothers and stuff and whatever in DC, sometimes I'll come out and defend them when it comes to these kind of matters. Because irregardless of how you feel about how they handled it at the end of the day or if it is or isn't enough or whatever, we can debate that until we're all blue in the face. But at least they did try to do something to make sure that we were compensated for the work that we did. And I highly, highly appreciate that as a creator. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's it's one of those things that actually speaks to the corporate culture that they have over there at Time Warner, which, again, Dave and I, we have no problem sometimes making fun of their decisions or things like that. But I, I can I can tell you, it says right here, you know, uh, that basically, you know, it says with the rise of streaming service such as Netflix has removed uh, many forms of comp compensation um, and the decision by traditional movie studios like Warner Brothers and Disney to release films on their own in-house subscription services has further upended these old ways of doing business. When Warner Brothers opted to send its entire film slate to HBO Max, realizing the movie theaters were only operating at a limited capacity for much of the year, the studio had to pay tens of millions of dollars to the stars of those films. That resulted in actors such as Will Smith, Denzel Washington, Keanu Reeves earning their full back end on the movies that Warner Brothers released on its new service. So again, contrast this to the way that Disney is doing business, the way that Marvel has been doing business and is still doing business under Disney. Uh, th these, this is really interesting, and, and it's really interesting to think of how this might have an effect uh, on the streaming wars going forward. Because, hey, if you're talent, 
I would much rather work for Warner Brothers at this point than for Disney. I mean, it's it's pretty obvious. I mean, it, it, it's pretty crystal clear that you're going to be taken care of better by Warner Brothers than you are by Disney. You know, and I had a friend many, many years ago who told me, um, they gave me the advice. They said, uh, they said, don't, don't, don't work for Disney. And I'm like, why? It's like, because they'll find a way to own anything you ever draw from that moment on. And I don't begrudge Disney, whatever, but it is weird uh, when you think about it. Um, and, you know, like I said, you know, Marvel's got a history of this. I, I mentioned before, you know, I didn't get to do a lot of work over at Marvel with my, with an actual name credit, but the one big one book I did get to work on, which was X-Men sort of the Braddocks with Scott Clark, they reprinted that and repackaged that in all these different ways because that's an early Psylocke number one, the X-Men character, Psylocke. And, um, you know, Scott and I never saw anything beyond the initial release, you know. Uh, and, you know, regardless of how you feel about the book, it, it's just funny because, um, let's see, what's the worst thing I ever worked on over at DC? The thing that I, I when people show it to me, I, I feel bad. Um, Grifter Zero is pretty bad. And uh, that the first thing that I worked on at DC, I got a credit for Cry for Justice. That last issue of Cry for Justice that Scott and I did did together. That book was super rushed because we had to turn we had to turn our portion of that book around in a weekend, and it was rough. Um, but you know, I see more for that. I see more for the six or eight pages that we did as a fill in as a part of a Titans issue, like all these Mister Terrific. Like we were on Mister Terrific for like like one issue we filled in. Like I see more for Mr. Terrific than I ever saw for the X-Men book I worked on over at Marvel. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. It's re it's it's really crazy. Again, th this is just a contrast in business practices between what Disney's doing and Warner Brothers and specifically what they're doing with streaming. Uh, what what yeah. they're doing in the streaming wars and and how they're adjusting to this sort of new reality. And uh, again, I'm going to give it to, to Warner Brothers that, that they're they're doing it right. You know what I mean? You can you can be upset about the fact that they're releasing everything on HBO Max simultaneously, but you know what? They're doing it in a way much better than Disney Plus is. Much better than Disney's doing it. And again, they're supporting the people that actually were involved in the creation of this stuff, and not ripping them off as you know CBS has done and as Disney is doing. Okay, because there's there's a there's a difference between these companies. There really is. Um, David Motz mentions, he says, uh, I would rather support local theaters than Disney Plus. David Motz, I am right with you. I will absolutely support theaters more than I will support Disney Plus any day of the week. I'd much rather pay that premium price at the theater. Uh, that includes the popcorn, that includes the soda, all that stuff that you may say is overpriced. But hey, I understand how the industry works. And I know that the theater isn't getting most of that ticket price, especially the first two weeks, that special engagement. That's what that means. Basically, your theater is not getting any of that ticket or very little of that ticket price. They're getting that money through the, the popcorn and the, the, th the soda and all that other kind of stuff. So I agree with you, David Motz. Any day of the week, I would much rather support a local theater than Disney+. Plus. Uh, Asia mentions, she says, I, I keep HBO. They give me my movies, but regarding Scarlett Johansson, and we did talk about this a little bit, her team should adjust with the times. And I am, that is one of the surprising aspects of this article. Like I can see writers not understanding this because writers generally don't have the same level of representation that an actor does, right? Just, just in general, you can just say that in general. But we're, when we're talking about Scarlett Johansson, she is A-list. I mean, she's A-list. I mean, there's no, there's no debating that. She's an A-list actress, right? So the fact that her team didn't look into this or, or foresee this at all, granted, Black Widow came out, you know, before the, you know, was being filmed or whatever before the pandemic and everything. But the fact that they couldn't see the writing on the wall, I mean, we've been talking about the streaming wars for years now, basically, you know, th th this has been heating up for a while. And the fact that you wouldn't look into that, you know, or your representation wouldn't look into that. And, uh, you know, maybe they did, you know, there might be more to this lawsuit than meets the eye, but. But, but on, just on the, on the surface of it, I would have thought that they kind of would have covered this a little bit better as far as, as the rights from streaming because streaming's been around for a long time. Been around for a long time. Very interesting.